I don't know how many of you made it to any of the prayer conference this week over at the Mace location. What a, what a great event. Pastor Steve Hage is, well, now he's a great teacher, but he can get away with saying things I could never say. <laughs> right? If I said things that he says, they just look at me and go, no, don't do that. Just, just don't. Just don't. Um, but, um, but kind of piggybacking a little bit off of uh, what he was teaching and really what I already had planned to teach this week before I knew where he was going, so obviously the Holy Spirit was going somewhere. Uh, we're talk today, if you want to open your Bibles up to Mark chapter 4. Um, this is a, really a message and kind of leading into a theme that, uh, that God has me moving in here in these, in these next uh, however many weeks really looking at how Jesus operated on earth. You know, that, that he came to this earth to complete a work that he did fully complete. But also he is here, and the Gospels record for us what he did and how he did it so that we learn some things. I love one of the things, though, that, that, that Steve Hage said is that we don't necessarily need to look at Jesus uh, as an example for us, but he's an example of us. Right? Remember, I taught a few weeks ago, as he is, so are we in this world, or at least we're supposed to be. That doesn't mean that's the pressure on to make sure don't sin so that you'll be like Jesus. It is take on the righteousness he gave you, and you'll begin to look more and more like him. All right, so we're going to talk today, uh, taking this familiar story of Jesus being in the boat with the disciples, and a storm comes. How many have ever been in a storm? Right, anybody, a few of you here have been in a storm before. And, uh, and then sometimes we're in a storm, we're wondering, what's going on? Doesn't Jesus care? Because he's just sleeping. Anybody ever been there before? You don't have to admit, I guess, that you've actually wondered if maybe Jesus is asleep in your storm. And so let's read uh, the account of this story. It says here in verse, uh, Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. On the same day when the evening had come, he said to them, to the disciples, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. So there's the disciples in the boat with Jesus. So sometimes we forget this wasn't the only boat in the storm. There were a bunch of little boats around there that didn't have Jesus in their boat. But how many know that those other little boats got the same benefit, didn't they? Same storm got calmed down because they were around Jesus. Happened to be in the right place at the right time. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Right? If you've ever been out on a boat, I've never been out like on the ocean in a small boat. I've been out on like the, the cruise liners. And even that, you're on a cruise liner and if it starts moving too much, you're like, whoa. <laughs> Could imagine being out there in a, in a small fishing vessel and the storms start coming and, and it's starting to take on water. And you, you don't have to be uh, a, like a, a sea captain or anything to know that taking in water is not good. All right, so here they are. Things are not looking good. Uh, but he, Jesus, was in the stern or in the back asleep on a pillow. Jesus is asleep on a pillow when the storm's going on. You know, I thought it was interesting. Why did they point out that he was asleep on a pillow? Why on a pillow? Why did make a mention of the pillow? I thought about this. I thought, I know why. Because God knew that we, as sometimes harebrained as we are, find this one scripture that says that Jesus had nowhere to lay his head, and we go, Jesus is poor, he didn't even have a pillow. <laughs> so here we are, proof that Jesus owned a pillow. It's right here. <laughs> so he was asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I know you've never been harsh in talking to God before. But here are the disciples. They're a little, they're a little frustrated, right? We're, this Jesus who's doing all these miracles, now we need him, and he's asleep in our boat. Don't you know that there's a storm going on? Right? Don't, you, don't you care? Now think about this. This goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? What did Satan use against Eve? Is God's holding out on you? He doesn't really care about you. This is, this is who God is. See, this is the same seed that has always been planted. We're always concerned. We think that maybe God doesn't care. So here they are. Jesus is there with them. They know that he could fix this, but he's asleep, and they're upset about it. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. 
Now, I know maybe you've seen the old movies of, the, of this depiction, and Jesus goes, peace, be still. I don't believe that's how Jesus talked here, because he made a point of putting an exclamation point. Right? He spoke to it. Notice that, now he's going to go on and correct the disciples, but you know, he rebuked the storm first before he addressed the situation with the disciples. Sometimes we're thinking that God is, we want to go to God for help. We're in the middle of our storm, but we're afraid that we're going to get rebuked. Right? Because sometimes, now this wasn't their fault, but sometimes you made your own storm. Anybody ever made their own storm before? Right? Series of bad decisions that started with a very small bad decision that led to many more bad decisions. They seem to multiply, and then suddenly you have a storm. And then you, don't, you feel like, I don't want to go to Jesus because I'm going to get yelled at. Are you ever, you're ever that way as a kid, right? You knew you needed something from mom and dad. You know that they, they've been watching. They know the situation you're in is because you messed this up, and you're going to get to see I told you so. And so you almost rather stick in your mess than have to deal with the see I told you so. We have to be careful not to look at God that way. Sometimes when we need him most is when the enemy wants you to feel estranged from God or afraid to talk to him. I, I say this frequently when, well, almost every time when I have to uh, officiate a, a funeral or a, a home going, as we like to say. You know, that I remind people that, you know, in those particular moments is when the enemy likes to come and get you mad at God because he knows you need him, you need him the most. So he, he tells you these lies that, that God took this person and he had some purpose in all of this that you just don't understand. But to get you angry with God at the moment you need him most. And this is what the enemy likes to do. So here, the disciples were in a, in, a, in a situation where they needed Jesus, but Jesus, when he came, he took care of the situation first. You don't have to rebuke them and then, well, let's get everything right and then I'll fix your situation. Let's get the situation taken care of. Let's call him this storm. And Jesus speaks to it. Now remember, this isn't my message today, but remember, as he is, so are we in this world. Right, so when we see some storms, we should be remembering, this is how Jesus handled storms. He spoke to him. He told him to knock it off. He didn't whisper in a calm voice, and perhaps with a British accent, because that <laughs> seems like all the depictions of Jesus. I don't know how Jesus ended up with a British accent. They're all, they're all white British people with British accents. Okay, so, but Jesus, right, he looked at, just as we studied last week, right, that Paul looked at the situations around him that weren't right, and he became greatly annoyed, and then he spoke to him with the name of Jesus. So you have the authority to speak to the storms in your life. Not on your authority, because your authority is always going to fall short. And if you think it's your authority, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to shy away from speaking to the storms in your life because you think, I'm not worthy. I don't have the authority to speak this. I made this storm. How, can I, how, how should I speak to it? I think all the more so because you created it, so you've got some authority to tell it to knock it off. But it isn't your authority. It's the name of Jesus that you can speak to things and cause things to change. And so this is what Jesus says. He speaks to the storm, and it, and it says, and then there was a, not just calm, there was great calm. It, I don't know, but I'm picturing the way it all ended, like it was freaky calm after it stopped. Right? Because people like to reason and go, well, you know what happened. It just happened to be the moment. Jesus looked up and he saw the storm was about to clear, and he said, be still at the precise time. So everyone was like, oh, cool. No, see, Jesus didn't have to do that because, well, he's Jesus. He spoke to a storm, and it says there was great calm. It said there was great calm before, but there was great calm after. You know that sometimes we find that the, that the storms that either we've created or the enemy brings into our life or we just seem to find, we get really loud. But when God does his thing, it's quieter than it was before when you get to the other side. Okay. Verse 40. Now, but he said to them, why are you so fearful? Right? He didn't go through the bone gates. All right, who had sin in their life and brought the storm? Right, who, whose fault is it? Well, he addressed to all of them. The, the storm was going to come. You know, what Jesus has told us other places, the storms in life are going to come. There's, it doesn't matter where we go. We're not the, the rainbows and unicorns church. And you just, you know, you get saved and nothing bad will ever happen to you again. And if it does, it might be because you have some unresolved sin in your life. And that's why this is happening. No, the, 
Storms in life are going to come, but we have some authority over them. Why are we afraid? And so, why are you afraid of the storm? Or think about this. Where do we begin? Jesus said, let's go to the other side. So if Jesus said we're going to the other side, we're going to the other side. So no storm, I don't know how big it's going to get, is going to stop us from getting to the other side if we'll trust in Jesus. Right, so he said we're going to the other side. Now he says, why are you fearful? I told you we're going to the other side. So why are you afraid? And I'm sure they're like, uh, did you see that storm, Jesus? I know you were sleeping for most of it. I remember at the very end, it actually wasn't that bad. It was while you were sleeping. It was really bad. Because right, that's what it feels like when, when it gets really bad if you feel like Jesus is asleep. Okay, so he says, why are you fearful? How is it that you have not enough faith? And what does it say? You have no faith. He went, like, he went right for the jugular on that one. Right? How is it how is it that you have no faith? I don't even understand how you could have no faith. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? They didn't get it yet because they're still in fear. They're like, well, we might be, need to be afraid of this guy because if he can do that, let's not get on his bad side. And so let's, let's, let's back up a little. I'm going to use one of my patented, what was the first phrase that was here? It said, on the same day. What day? What day was it? That's what I want to know. It's going to set some context and some tone for what happened here and how Jesus responded to the situation and how he responded to them. It was on that same day. So let me tell you a bit about that same day. We go back to the beginning of this chapter and towards the end of chapter 3, and there's some things that Jesus addressed. Well, actually, let's go back and read just a little bit of it. I don't have time to read all of it, so I've got to go to my notes and decide, wrote down what, what parts we wanted to read. Go back to the beginning of Mark and go to verse 2. Mark 4, 2. Then he taught them, saying many things by parables, and said to them in this teaching, listen, there's an exclamation point again. Listen. All right, it wasn't. Listen, all who will hear. <laughs> Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it, much like your winter ryegrass seeds. <laughs> the birds come and they devour it. I think they like the topper stuff now, too. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some 30, some 60, and some a hundred, and he said to them, He who has ears, let him hear. And that's not a separate statement. He says, He who has ears, let him hear. Listen to what I just told you. Or if, if you have ears, listen. So then we go down a little bit further. And now keeping in mind, if, if you go back a couple chapters, you find out that these, these stories that Jesus is telling, these parables, are being told to a multitude, but it was really meant to be for his disciples. But just as kind of things would happen, when Jesus would go around, people just started gathering. Everybody know that when Jesus is lifted up, he draws men unto him. Or you start walking this earth as he is, so are we in this earth. People start being drawn to you because there's Jesus in you. And people are drawn. So he tells a story to the, to the, to the masses that are there uh, about sowing. Well, then he goes and has to explain it because his disciples didn't get it. We go down to verse, let's go to 13. I don't know if I gave you guys this for the screen, but we're going to thir verse 13. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? They came to him like, they're like, master, explain to us what this meant. All right, this is his disciples. Sometimes we, we, we can uh, beat ourselves up because we're, we're not getting it. I think it's great for us to see the disciples who followed around every day struggled to understand sometimes. I had to ask them, and it's okay. 
Now, he didn't rebuke him and tell him, no, forget it. I tell the story once, and if you didn't get it, too bad. If there's a recording of it, you can listen to it again. You can hop online, it's on YouTube. He says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? So he said, this one is the most important. If you can't get a hold of this, you're not going to understand any of the rest of them I'm going to tell. The sower sows the word. So the, 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 the seed being talked about in this parable, then he's saying, is the word. The word of God being sown. And these are the ones by the wayside when the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown into their hearts. So sometimes, and and this isn't to, he doesn't tell this parable to condemn you that you're stony ground and, and you wicked, lowly worm, you better change. It's telling you that if you're seeing these things happen, this is what's going on. Let's work on it. So maybe you leave here on Sunday and you've got, you're excited about the word, you're, you're ready to, to take that and apply it to your life this week and it just seems like right away it's, it's stolen from you. So, there's, so Satan comes and he immediately takes away the word that was sown into their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who when they hear the word immediately receive it with gladness and they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So the word comes, they get really excited about it, but there's no root in their life. Now, I, I, I will see this happen so often with people who, they're, they're very excited about whatever it was I said you should do this week, but there's no root underneath it. It is part of that knowledge of good and evil. Give me a checklist of something to do. Okay, I'm going to do that, and then my life's going to change everything this week because I'm going to do what he said this week. And then it doesn't work because you have no root that 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 was sown into. You're just looking for the next thing that I'm going to tell you to do, that you're going to do that, and it's going to change your whole life. right? It's, I remember back in, when we were young, married, uh, it was kind of, a, I guess it's a thing when you're in, the, in, the, in your 20s, that everybody's doing all these different little business things, and every one of them's got this thing, and you're going to sign up for our program, and you're going to get three of your friends, and your whole life's going to change, and you watch people, and like every three months, they're on a different one, right? It's, it, was, it was just stony ground. I'm looking for the next thing that I'm going to have to do nothing but just sign up and give somebody my money, and then I'm going to become a millionaire, and it doesn't work. And I do the next one, and the next one. These people are often that way with the word. Just take the word, give me the next thing I'm going to do. But there's no... That, that seed never gets into the ground. I watch the people who are planted in God's house, who receive the word on a regular basis, and are just going about their daily business, applying a little bit at a time and growing. And these are the people who grow the roots and become strong, and the storms of life come, and it doesn't blow them down. And so we don't want to be that stony ground. We will be this the soft ground where the word gets in and begins to produce. You know, that that you can get a hold of sometimes, I know many of you can attest to this, you can get a hold of one verse or half of a verse, and boy, it just, it sticks with you for months. I just keep speaking to you. I don't need another word. I mean, yes, I need the word every day. I don't need a brand new, fresh thing. Okay, yeah, I studied that yesterday. Give me something new today. I need something different. Now let the word begin to work in me. Okay. Verse 18, now these are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. There's this other junk in your life that you allow it to choke out the word. It's a lot of, of, well, yeah, that sounds good, but. You ever notice our but gets us in trouble? Yeah, that's the word. I I get that. I, I hear what you're saying, Pastor. But you don't understand uh, where I've been. You don't know my situation. I don't have to, because the word is the word. Right? We, we have to get the butts out of the way. Get, let, stop letting the butt choke out the word. And so the cares of life comes, his cares of, of this world, deceitfulness of wealth, meaning that I'll solve my problems if I just have what I need. If I have all of this, and I have this, and I have this, then all my needs will be taken care of. What that says is I don't need God. I can take care of everything. You know, God desires to bring you, it's, it's, it's 
says in the Old Testament, he wants to bring you wealth without sorrow. He wants to bring you the good things without all the cares that go with it. You know, some of the, the wealthiest people are also the most fearful people. They're always worried about losing it, and somebody's taking it. I'm going to make a bad decision and lose it all. God wants to bring you the good things in life without all the worry with it. Okay. But then verse 20. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some 30, some 60, and some 100. Okay, so he explained to them. Now remember, this is what happened that day before the storm came, before the disciples were reacting the way they were. He had been speaking to them about, I sow word, and what kind of, depending on what kind of ground you are, it's going to produce or it's going to not produce. So Jesus is kind of saying that all of you are one of those grounds that is not working right yet. And I think every one of them, it was a different thing. Maybe some of them, it was the fear. Some of, there's all kinds of different reasons that it wasn't working yet in their lives. And Jesus doesn't come to condemn you for being the wrong kind of ground. The Holy Spirit helps you identify where you've got the wrong kind of ground. And it then empowers you to change your ground, to till up your ground, get the stones out of your ground, get those things out of the way so that you can become fruitful. See, this is what he's after in your life. He wants your life to be fruitful and productive. You were designed to be fruitful and productive. That's, that's how we were designed. We get satisfaction and, and value in life when we know we're fruitful and productive. I was sharing this what, a couple weeks ago about how we don't get nearly as tired when we work like crazy, but it's fruitful. Or when you're working and working and working, but it's producing and you're finding success, you don't get nearly as tired and burned out as you do when you work and you work and you work and it's fruitless. Or you were designed to be, and God wants to partner with you. That's what the promised land is about, is having the land, the soil of your life being a place that God can produce with you, and produce great things. Okay, so this is one of the things he taught. Well, he goes on and teaches a couple other things uh, here leading into this. We'll take us down to verse 20, I guess 21, okay. Mark 4, 21, and also he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket, under a bed? No, I'm gonna let it shine. <laughs> Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will be, not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Here he goes again with the ears. Right? He's, what is he saying? Are you listening? Are you listening to what I'm saying? Are you hearing? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Have you ever... But like, you just want to say that to your kids. Like, I just don't. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. He's telling them again. He's, laying, he's giving them a few clues, isn't he? Listen to what I'm telling you. Take heed to what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. Now, there's another place he uses the same idea that what you, you know, press down, shaking together, running over. This is Paul talks about this. Here, Jesus uses this, and the more you will listen, the more you're going to produce. The more, this, is, this doesn't mean, because you know, then, then what we do is in our, in our checklist, give me the tasks to do thing, we go, well, my life should be going really good because I have Scripture playing all the time. Well, it's good to have Scripture playing all the time. That's a good thing. But that's, that's not being the ears to hear and it's going to necessarily change your life just because it's on. Do you listen? Because God speaks through his word. Right? We found out when Jesus explained that, that first parable, he was saying a lot more than what he said. He's always saying more than what he's saying. The Holy Spirit is there to help you hear more than what he said. You can read a story in here, and, and he can reveal all sorts of things to you that weren't even on the page. It's not just that you heard it, it's that you heard it by the Spirit. You listen to what he's saying. Okay. For whoever has, verse 25, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. He's not saying God's going to take it away from him. 
Remember, he said earlier, the cares of life, deceitfulness, of everything takes these things from you if you don't really listen to them and allow them to get into your life. They just become words. But what you have, if you become a hearer, see, God likes good ground. He likes fruitfulness. The more that you hear and bring in, the more you'll keep receiving. Boy, I find I get in, the more I get into the Word, the more I want to be in the Word. The more I chew on a, a section of Scripture, the more I want to chew on it even more. It is that if you have ears to hear, he's going to keep, he'll keep talking. Oh, you want to hear what I have to say? I'll speak to you. You know, we think about uh, Mary and Martha who were, you know, Jesus comes over and we have one sister who's doing all the work and the other is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening. And Jesus didn't rebuke, when, when the other comes and says, well, rebuke her because she's not helping. I'm doing all the work and she's just sitting here. And Jesus goes, no, no. She's, she's the one that, that's doing the right thing. She's listening. She's here to hear what I have to say. We want to be those. Sometimes we get so busy with everything. We get even busy with trying to do our hearing, right? If you make your, your reading the Bible or listening to script, whatever you do, you make it a task, it becomes a task and it becomes work. But just taking the time to listen. For, I don't know, we're all different personalities and it works different for us. I, I can't give you, okay, now do it this way because then there's certain people that will do, the, do that way and then it won't work for them because <laughs> that's my way. That's how it works for me. But we want to become much more here. So again, he's on him about hearing the word and being good ground and seed. Now go to verse 26. Here I thought we were going to read all of chapter 4, but we're reading all of chapter 4. Verse 26 and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Here he is with the seed again. And should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. So you see, he's, he's building this up in layers. Hear the word, we have the seed. And, and now he's, he's, he's addressing human mind that has to think logically, well, how does it work? How does it work? If I don't understand how it works, I can't. I can't make it. I can't accept it if I don't understand it. I use this example all the time. How many of you? How many of you really understand how your cell phone works? I don't really. There's a few people here who could probably explain it to me, and and I'll smile and nod. But I still won't understand. <laughs> we don't. But we use it all the time. We go. I'm not using this thing because I don't understand how it works. Right? We don't get in our car. And I used to know how a car worked. Now there's so many things in there. I don't know how any of those things are working. You used to be at an engine, you had a carburetor. Right? You did a few things and you knew how they worked. But I don't stop driving a car because I don't understand how it works. So he's, saying, he's addressing that in them now. So the seed and the sowing, I know you're, you know you're thinking, how does this work? He says, you know, the farmer does this. He plants the seed. He doesn't ask how it works. He just plants, he sows. Let me go on and read it because Jesus says it better than me. For the earth yields crops by itself, first a blade, then a head, after that the full grain in the head, but when the grain ripens, immediately he pulls in the sickle because the harvest time has come. So he's been preaching them about getting word, trust, that you sow that word in the good ground, it's going to produce. It's a process. It's a system. It will produce. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, right? The, the, the farmer doesn't plant his seed and go out the next day and go, where's my harvest? I, I don't think anything's happening. I mean, look at it. It looks the same as it did yesterday. This doesn't work. What a scam. No, he knows that it takes time. So the word gets sown into your life and you give it time to do its work. Now, I'm not looking for the next thing that's going to change my life. I'm, I'm going to keep chewing on, allow that word to continue to do its, its work in me because it will produce harvest and there's going to come the time that's going to be so obvious and now I'm, I'm harvesting from that seed. All right, then, I'm going to just read 28 through 30 because I have to because I, I don't want you to think I'm skipping it. Right, because here's, my Bible has the, the little headline above it, the unpardonable sin. All right, so we need to, I better address it. It's not part of my sermon today, but I don't want you to think I'm skipping it. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven. All right, we just say that all sins will be forgiven. The sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never 
has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. But they said, he has an unclean spirit. So, I don't know, if you ever wondered, what if I've already committed the unpardonable sin and I don't even know it? Why, why do I even bother going to church? Because if I did it, I'm, I'm already destined anyway, so what's the point? Right, because there's so much debate about what's the unpardonable sin? And religion likes to keep you wondering and not knowing for sure so that you're always in fear of not committing that unpardonable sin. Because if I do it, even Jesus said, I can't be forgiven. You know what the only unpardonable sin is? What blasphemes the Holy Spirit is reject Jesus. That's the only thing. All sins have been forgiven, but the unpardonable sin is if you reject Jesus. Because without Jesus, there, you can't, there is no forgiveness. The only way our sins can be forgiven is through Jesus. We can't become good enough. We can't make things right. Good news, though, Jesus did. That's the only unpardonable sin is to reject Jesus. Okay, yeah, I can dig in it deeper on another day because if you're not sure you believe me, that's okay. We'll get to it on another day. Okay, so we got through all this, and then we, we got through parable of, of sower. Oh, actually, it wasn't where I was supposed to be. I was in chapter 3, so that was a bonus. Okay, my Bible flipped over pages. So we have parable of sower. We talked about sowing seed. Now we get into verse 30, we, more of the same, parable of the mustard seed, the, the smallest seed producing great things. So Jesus has been speaking to them over and over and over all this whole day about seed of the word. Listen to what I say and apply this. Become ground. Let this produce in your life. And here the storm came and they had an opportunity to use what they've been taught. And they couldn't yet do it. See, but it's okay because Jesus was on their boat. See, this is the grace of God. He wants the best for you. He gives you instruction. He wants you to learn how to do the things the right way, but he knows that sometimes you're going to fall on your face at the worst possible moment. But guess what? He's still on the boat. And we can call out to him just like they did, even though they called out to him a little bit mad. Jesus still came and he called him the storm. But I love this, something that, man, it just jumped off the page when I was reading this this week. It said this. Okay, so in verse 36 of chapter 4. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. That is a strange thing to say. As he was. And so we have to learn to take Jesus as he is. Not the Jesus we think he is. Not the, not the Jesus that that Uncle Bill said he was. Sorry if you're Uncle Bill. I'm sure you say great things about Jesus. But not the Jesus that that preacher on TV said he was. Not the, the Jesus that the, that the atheist friend said he is. You have to take him as he is. As he is. That's how we take him. That's the Jesus we need. See, they're on the boat, and they had, I think... They, they, they had the Jesus they wanted. The Jesus they wanted was the one who just does everything. Right? He's asleep. Why is he asleep? The Jesus I need is sleeping. I need a different Jesus. Give me one that cares. Right? He, don't you care? We need, we, we need Jesus as he is. Let me tell you about the Jesus as he is. Go back to chapter 3. And verse 14. This is when he called the twelve disciples. Verse 14, then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sickness and cast out demons. He, he gave them power. See, the Jesus they had on their boat is the same one that's on your boat, and he's the one who gave you power. They gave you the power to speak to the storm that you don't have to be in fear and worry about the things swirling around you. I'm not telling you they're not big. I'm not telling you I discount the storms going on in your life. They're big, but Jesus is bigger. And he gave you the authority to speak to it, just like he had the disciples. See, he kept harping on them. If you have ears, hear. Listen to what I'm telling you. I gave you authority. And then I keep reminding you, the seed of the word, let it produce in your life. And here a test showed itself in front of you. And this time you failed the test, but it's okay because Jesus is on your boat. 
Right? Don't, don't get worried. Because sometimes people think, boy, all that stuff you're talking about is great, Pastor, but man, you don't have no idea how far away I am from getting to that point in my life. It's okay. Because Jesus is in your boat. And have Jesus as he is. The Jesus who was in their boat, he didn't rebuke them because they failed. He didn't refuse to help them because they failed. And they did. I told you like four times to listen. He didn't listen. No, this storm's yours. You deal with it. Good luck with it. I'm going to go back to sleep on my pillow because I own a pillow. But no, he was right there. The Jesus as he is. See, but, but sometimes we, we've twisted who Jesus is and we think, I have the Jesus who's not going to help me. I have the Jesus who might help somebody. He might go help that pastor, but he won't help me. I have the Jesus who's going to rebuke me for my sins before he'll help me. I just don't, I'm not ready to deal with that. I can't deal with, with all my junk being dealt with right now, and so I, I won't go to, I can't go to that well. I'll go somewhere else. I'll figure it out on my own. Or the storm will just overtake me. But we have to remember, we have Jesus as he is. The Jesus who is full of love, who poured his life out, as, as I said earlier during ministry time, that, that scripture out of Romans, that, that while we were yet sinners, he gave his best. He poured it all out for us when we were our worst. So even if today you feel like you're at your worst, like, Pastor, if you knew what I did this week, or how bad I messed it up this week, I don't know if this, no, 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 I know, I don't know, but I know Jesus. I know who Jesus, as he is, is. And he's right there going, okay, you got to wake me up to come fix that. I'll come fix it for you. And I'm going to keep speaking to you. You know, that wasn't the last time he talked to him about having ears to hear. He kept talking to him about it, kept reminding him. And you know what? I think they got it because we're all here today. All right? They had to have got it at some point because Jesus left this earth and they kept the church going. And here we are today, over 2,000 years later. So I'm telling you, don't give up in your storm. You got the power to speak over it, but if you're failing in it, you got Jesus. And he'll work with you. You'll keep coming. Guess what? There'll be another storm you have an opportunity to speak to. Trust me. Amen? Amen. If you got anything out of this morning, give the Lord a hand.